During the 1960s, advances in machinery brought about new, easy-care synthetic fibers. As a result, cotton lost many of its traditional markets. Realizing this, U.S. upland cotton producers conceived a self-help agricultural promotion program. The Cotton Research and Promotion Program is a public-private partnership that allows U.S. cotton producers to pool their resources to fight for more demand for cotton. Our cotton producers, along with importers of cotton products, contribute about $75 million per year to try and make cotton the fabric of everyone's lives. The Cotton Research and Promotion Program invests the funds collected from U.S. cotton producers and importers into groundbreaking research and compelling consumer promotion developed and implemented by Cotton Incorporated, a company governed by cotton producers. The Cotton Board contracts with Cotton Incorporated to carry out the Cotton Research and Promotion Program. And through that investment, we've created a state-of-the-art research facility uh, here in Cary, North Carolina. We've driven progress in new cotton products that consumers find attractive and want to buy. And, you know, the most important thing we've done is we've developed the seal of cotton, a brand that is known around the world as a source of comfort, as a source of quality, and quite frankly, as the brand of this program. With a high level of expertise on staff at Cotton Incorporated, state-of-the-art labs and equipment at the world headquarters in Cary, North Carolina, and the full scope of research being conducted by Cotton Incorporated, the Cotton Research and Promotion Program is working hard to increase the demand for and profitability of cotton. Cotton Incorporated is charged with doing research and marketing activities on behalf of U.S. cotton growers and importers, and it really expands the entire supply chain from the production of cotton all the way to the consumer. For example, we have agricultural and fiber quality research activities uh, focused primarily at the grower Jenner segment. We're involved in improving production efficiencies. We're involved in sustainability and, and ultimately to help improve fiber quality. So really all things cotton, from improving cotton production, producer level, to increasing demand at the consumer level, all to try to improve the demand and profitability for U.S. cotton. Uh, Cotton Incorporated employs about 145 full-time folks who are either in the marketing effort or in the research, and we're all here to try to improve the demand and profitability for cotton. Just as cotton starts in the field, so does the research being done at Cotton Incorporated. There, the Agricultural and Environmental Research Department provides research and technical services to cotton growers, ginners, and their support industries, and also serves as a link between cotton production, the textile industry, and the research and extension communities. So in the Agricultural and Environmental Research Department, we fund projects that cover all range of cotton production activities from entomology, plant pathology, weed science, agronomy, plant breeding, ag engineering. Right now, sustainability is a very important topic and growers' attitudes about, consumers' attitudes about their practices is increasing in importance. So right now we're focusing on a lot of projects that are involved in precision application of inputs, whether it be a pesticide, fertilizers, water, just how can we reduce our overall footprint and increasing yields or preserving yields while using fewer inputs. The cotton industry has achieved significant environmental gains over the past 40 years, but it's not resting on its laurels. Around the world, scientists and researchers strive to develop new ways to grow, process, and manufacture cotton more efficiently and with increasingly less impact on the environment. The cotton industry has a long track record of innovation, and that's primarily driven to increase profitability through yield or reduce costs. Today, that's no different, and we've over the past had a lot of efforts to reduce both cost and inputs, and today that's called sustainability. So we have a lot of efforts that include things such as the implementation of nutrient monitoring, water sensors, and precision ag, and various other technologies that we're implementing. And that's going to be good for the growers, bottom line, as well as for sustainability. The U.S. is the world's most reliable producer of high-quality cotton. Cotton Incorporated helps maintain this leadership position through ongoing research in their fiber competition division. If a new development is created and it's released to the industry, then we provide textile testing services for the facilities that are adopting that technology. A formulation or a recipe that works within our labs has to be adapted and modified so that it can work in the specific textile facility that wants to use that cotton technology. So we would provide a variety of testing services on their production runs to ensure that the new technology is performing as it should. 
The Product Development Laboratories at Cotton Incorporated is a well-equipped research and development facility capable of producing a wide range of knit and woven fabric constructions. The division also provides inspirational and technical fabric development ideas to all facets of the textile and apparel industries. So in the product development area, we're constantly needing to show new ideas in cotton to brands and retailers that make the decisions that go on the store shelves. So we're always looking everywhere. We do a lot of store research. We travel all over the world looking for ideas. We study scientific journals. We just put different types of yarn on knitting machines and weaving looms to see what kind of new ideas we can generate. Through the Global Supply Chain Marketing Division, Cotton Incorporated works with companies, organizations, and associations in the world supply chains for fiber products. Division staff offer technical guidance, innovations, and marketing knowledge to cotton businesses through one-on-one -on -one meetings, educational workshops, and industry events. The Global Supply Chain Marketing Division works with manufacturers, brands, and retailers to get cotton on the product shelf. We work to keep cotton competitive in the market after it leaves the farm. It's our job to identify decision makers within the supply chain and to determine how best to influence them. We have a variety of tools available to us to help us do that and to move the needle for cotton. We have our trans-dry moisture management technology, our storm water repellent technologies, these tools and technologies offer retailers a way to differentiate their product, but also to offer their consumers something they want, cotton and performance. The Consumer Marketing Division is comprised of five departments, Advertising, Strategic Alliances, Public Relations, Corporate Strategy, and Global Market Insights. Consumer Marketing Division's purpose is to motivate consumers and the supply chain to search for and buy cotton products. It is also to affirm cotton as the primary choice among sustainable products in the marketplace. We do this by keeping cotton visible and viable through advertising, public relations, and industry and market analysis for key decision makers. We promote cotton sustainability through programs such as Blue Jeans Go Green and cotton's fashionability with strategic retail and brand and partners through programs such as Cotton's first ever 60 second runway show that was shoppable. We focus on the consumer and trades purchase journey, awareness, engagement, and action to ensure that cotton is a preferred fiber for everyone. For more information on how the Cotton Board is investing in the future of the cotton industry, visit www.cottonboard.org. The sustainability story has been written out here for years. We've uh, been in the no-till deal under our pivots for a long time, since the mid-90s. Just where we have really, truly implemented no-till, it's amazing to see the foreign matter that is built up in the soil and what you're planting into. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, what I'm planning into now, I'd have never, I'd have had to disc under or got rid of 10 years ago to make it plant prettier. Uh, but that's, that's not what it's about. It's about protecting the soil, uh, holding your moisture. The next step we're taking is on our dry land. And uh, we have overseeded all of our dry land to rye. We've got the rye growing right now. We'll grow it probably another couple of months and then terminate it so we can catch our spring moisture and hold our spring moisture. And then we'll plant right into that cover crop on our dry land, just like we've been planting uh, in our irrigated. We've sowed wheat, we've sowed rye, we've sowed a rye radish mix to help permeate the soil. And, and then the radishes will, will rot and, and help on the fertility side of that. So we're trying two or three different things to figure out what we like the best. Just where we have really truly implemented no-till, it's amazing to see the foreign matter that is built up in the soil. Harvest didn't farm like his granddaddy. Uh, I don't farm like Harvest. There's still some practices that you follow, 
that, uh, that they followed and used. There's still that basic core, but man, things have changed. And through the research and development program through CI and the Cotton Board. Cotton Incorporated is out front and the things that they're presenting, the things they think of, the things that, that they're working on, the areas that, that even myself as a producer would never, would never think about was a place we needed to go. The best thing about early mornings is that it's just me. I say a little prayer of thanks every morning. I'm thankful for my toes, my feet, my legs, my heart, my lungs. I'm thankful that I can get up and run because there's so many people who want to and can't. I get up, feed my dog Olive, let her out, have a cup of coffee, and get ready for my run. I've been an avid runner since 2011. I had just gotten engaged and was trying to do something to get into shape. I've worked for the Cotton Board for 10 years now, and I remember one of the biggest issues the Cotton Research and Promotion Program was addressing was this consumer and brand perception that cotton was only for jeans and t-shirts, not for true performance apparel. They just didn't know what cotton was capable of, but Cotton Incorporated saw the potential and started developing finishing technologies that made cotton competitive in that market as well. Ten years ago, I never even paid attention to a tag when I bought something, but now it's the first thing I look at. If it's not made with at least 50% cotton, I'm not going to buy it. I'm continually so impressed with the cotton growers I get to interact with. What they know and how much they know, it's just really something. There is a level of care and stewardship that goes into every seed they plant. I try really hard to stick to natural fibers like cotton as much as possible. They breathe better, they don't hold odor, and they dry out faster. We're like that at home too. We try to be conscious of what we buy and its effect on our world. Cotton is renewable and that's important to me. Seeing that firsthand and finding new ways of using cotton in this world, it's inspiring. I like to continually push my limits to see how far I can go. The Cotton Research and Promotion Program also pushes limits to make sure cotton always has a place in the market, and I'm so proud to be part of it. We buy hundreds of thousands of pounds of cottonseed oil to run the Café de Monde. We've had some guys come over and try to dethrone cottonseed oil, but it, it hasn't worked. The Café du Monde was established in 1862 at this location in the New Orleans French Market. When I came to work here 32 years ago, we were using cottonseed oil to fry our beignets. Hubert Fernandez bought 
bought the Café de Mon in 1942. They were cooking in cottonseed oil at that time. He didn't change a thing. The recipes have been passed down from one generation to the next. We are cooking so many beignets that the oil, all the oil goes out absorbed on the beignet. We're continuously adding oil to our fryer. We don't throw any oil away. When you're in a food business, the most important thing you have is the quality of your product. That's what keeps your customers coming back. Don't even entertain the thought when somebody comes knocking at our doors asking us to use a different kind of oil to cook our beignets in. Now that's how important cottonseed is to our business. It's just, you know, part of the recipe. cotton farmers out there, I'd like to thank you for continuing to provide us with the, with the oil that we need to deliver our product to our customers. Thank you very much. Cotton is definitely the reason that we are here. Cotton is what has kept us here, and cotton will be what keeps us here in the future. The year we've had out here in West Texas has been crazy. I know my son-in-law is, is getting tired of me saying this, but, you know, saying, man, I've never seen that happen before. <laughs> I can remember a pastor told me one time, uh, he said, uh, Brother Bill. Brother Bill said, you guys amaze me out here in West Texas, said, you plant your crops in the middle of a desert, and then it amazes you when it doesn't rain, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We're probably coming off one of the roughest years because we didn't get any help from Mother Nature, but we're not in this for one year. This is a legacy that was started uh, by my, my father and Arvis's grandfather. I'm Matt Farmer. Uh, Diane's husband. Uh, I am the second largest farmer in this area. Uh, my daddy still outweighs me by about 20 pounds. <laughs> we farm in Dawson, Borden, and Lynn County in Texas. Primarily cotton. We take care of the land that we farm. We're proud of the land that we farm. The sustainability story has been written out here for years. When I think about sustainability in cotton, I think about how long some of this land has been in my family and been in Diane's family. My name is Diane Farmer. I am a fourth generation farmer. Uh, Matt and I have been married for 41 years. Most of that has been spent on the farm. And being a wife of a farmer, she has a lot of Ooh. patience. It is stressful at times. There's two times of the year that you would like to move somewhere else. <laughs> that is planting and harvest. <laughs> to have seen my grandparents, who were some of the hardest working people I know, uh, if they weren't up and out doing something, uh, well, I just never knew them to not be working. They had a lot of pride in the land. They passed that on to Dad and hopefully they pass that on to me. Uh, 
I'm Horace Woodle, and I'm a second generation of this family, and I'm so proud of all of them. Of course, yeah, farming was about all I knew. I thought it was a wonderful way of life. And I'm so tickled and proud of my family following in my footsteps. Arvis retired in 91 and turned everything over to me. And the, there's a lot of pressure in that to continue what his granddaddy started and, and then what he built on. And then now what we're trying to, to build on. Matt and I have always tried to raise our kids, and we've tried to raise them with a, a lot of faith, a lot of pride in who they were, and a lot of pride in what they did. Uh, pride in this land that God allows us to be caretakers of. Um, I'm Kristen Morgan. I am the fifth generation farmer. Been here all my life. Dad seemed to always make things fun on the farm. I remember him throwing us over into a tromping cotton in a, in a trailer and we, we didn't know we were working, we thought we were having fun. The newer generations and the way they think, this is one thing that has helped a lot bringing Garen into the business, into the family farm. I'm Garen Morgan. Uh, I'm a first generation cotton farmer in West Texas. I've been married to Kristen for 12 years. In the, in the few years that, that I've been uh, on the farm, things have changed dramatically. We've, we've doubled in size. Um, our farming practices have changed. One thing that's kind of stayed the same is, is, uh, is the family unit. There's a million things you can put on that crop to try to make it better. But the advice that my daddy gave me a long time ago was the best thing you can put on your cotton crop is your shadow. We sure don't have all the answers, but I also know that the funding and the money that Cotton Incorporated is putting back into our state-sponsored uh, programs uh, will benefit us in the future as they have in the past. I know we're out here every day on the farm working to keep cotton sustainable. The struggles on the farm, it doesn't matter if it's in West Texas, if it's in Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, it doesn't matter where you're, where you're growing cotton. The bottom line is the same. How can you produce more fiber and more seed with less inputs? A lot of that that we've learned has come from these programs that, that CI has put forward and, and, and the innovations that have come out of those programs in the past. The things that are coming out of, of Cotton Incorporated help us do that, help us do that a lot. I'm a first generation farmer. I'm, I'm a transplant, but my son will be a fifth. I hope that one day my grandchildren look back and they're proud of the way that Matt and I cared for this land. You feel a responsibility for the older generation that you took over the farm from? Mm -hmm. You feel a responsibility for the younger generation that you brought onto the farm and brought into the family farm business. I never knew Harvest's granddaddy, uh, but it's, I just think it's pretty cool that I walked the same turn rows that he walked. 